Hello, Christian. Hi. Hello. Hey. Hello, this, this is Dimitri. Could you hear me? Yes. Hi, Dimitri. How are you doing? Yeah, fine. Just finished my first dub development. Oh, nice. What'd you make? Um, a contract for making polls and voting for um, polls. Oh, nice. Very nice. So, so Hudson, just just so we understand, uh, what so this call is is being recorded and then you post it after on Reddit, but it's not live, or is it also live? It is not live. Uh, I record this and then I cut the recording. I take notes and then I post the uh, recording on YouTube and the notes on GitHub simultaneously. Oh. So you have to have to re-upload it to to YouTube. I thought that it just went automatically. No, uh, so I'm using Hangouts, not uh, what's the other one? There, there's another Google one that's like Hangouts, but it's like hang. Oh, it's called Hangouts Live. That's the one where you can like broadcast it to people. But no, yeah, this is the this is one I just uh, record myself. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, I, I I never understood the difference between. I I always get those confused also. Yeah, it, I need there needs you to be like a guide. Manually. Say it one more time. You have it. You have to edit the call like later manually. Not generally. So the only reason would be if I have like a Skype message pop up or something, and I have to like edit the video, or um like last time someone's audio was messing up and it made the volume spike like. An incredible amount, so I just muted that part so it wouldn't kill everyone's ears. Okay, and is is there a reason that we use normal hangouts and not live hangouts? Just so I understand. Sure. So, like the normal hangouts, um, the reason for us using that is that there's a with um, when I start a hangout from the Ethereum a, a foundation, like at Ethereum.org account, it allows like up to twenty five people. Uh, and that's the only, like, free solution for video conferencing that I've found. I don't think you can do that on Hangouts Live, but I'll look into that because that would be interesting because then we could have these, like, live with the community and stuff. Okay. Just wanted to know. Yeah. I think that'd be cool. Hey, Casey, can you hear us? Yep, I hear you. Awesome. Okay, so I think we have um, pretty much everyone who's going to be here, so let's get started. Uh, let me pull up the notes. Cool, so agenda item number one is the um, resolution from last week when we were talking about um, static call, peer call, revert opcode, dynamic return, and all that stuff, and... Uh, the parties who are interested are in a S Skype conversation that's been going on for the last three weeks, and it looks like what we're going for. I'm gonna say this, and then I'm gonna have Christian and Alex and a, uh, or Axic and a few other people correct me. Um, I think we're going with return data copy slash size and static call, but not peer call. Is that correct? Yeah, that's how I also understand it. <laughs> okay, the, great. The exact details of all this, uh, I'm not sure if those were decided yet. Yeah, I, I and think... And we also have revert. Oh, revert, yep, that's right. So revert's going in too. Yeah, this is more to decide which ones, which EIPs are going to be said to be going into Metropolis and which ones can be... Um, and which EIPs can be put in the status of uh, superseded or uh, withdrawn. So I'll be uh, handling that, or Casey and I both will be changing those statuses um, later. Okay, so um, is there any other comments on that right now, or is that one of those that can be fleshed out a little bit more in the EIPs? I, I think a lot of that's already there. There's just some little things people were... Uh, having questions about, I think Nick brought up something with, um, oh, something with call data and Metropolis, but I don't know if that's related to it. Uh, 
so, so I, I don't I don't fully understand uh, where the accept, acceptance come from. I, I I've seen a message from from Italic on the Skype channel that he wants this, but does it mean that it's the full full developers acceptance from other teams and? Yeah. So the uh, on the Skype chat, what? Uh, yeah, but I basically asked for a summary because there had been uh, the, the message you're referring to is the one Vitalik sent like about within the last 10 hours. And I basically asked for a summary. And the reason Vitalik was giving his opinion was he wasn't going to be here uh, this morning. He's like doing a talk or something and neither is Jeff. So um, what I got from that was he was just giving a summary. It's not like a for sure thing, but everybody who had a, like opinions on this last time had been talking it out over the past three weeks, and I saw Vitalik, Nick, Jeff, Martin, and um, Alex Berzazi uh, agree to it, but uh, it's totally still up for debate if anyone had any other opinions. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, that's that's a good question though. Kind of what, how things get accepted? Because someone asked that recently, and my view on it, because it's still kind of organic, is that uh, the people who care about it, if they come to a decision on it, and they're stakeholders in either the change or the, I guess, intelligence required to make the decision on the change, uh, that whenever they kind of come to agreement, that's when it happens. And if there's a stalemate. There can be other, you know, things like signaling methods like, um, you know, carbon vote or other things going on that can indicate, you know, uh, breaking a stalemate if it's like a big community decision um, or other things we're developing. So, yeah, it's it's kind of just case by case basis, but this is such like a super nerdy, like high level thing. I was just like these six people probably know what they're talking about. <laughs> Or I should say low-level thing. All right, cool. So that's pretty much settled. Um, so I still have a question. Oh, sure. A comment or what would, would like to get opinions about. So at some point it was suggested to uh, clear the return data on the first memory resize. Is there anyone who could give a reason for that? Or are there opinions on why this should be done? Who has uh, raised this idea? Gavin. Gavin has raised that. Was it in the Skype channel? It's a comment on the pull request, I think. So I, I cannot like answer right now, but I can do some investigation uh, and try to respond to that in the comments. But it's hard for me to tell it if that has any benefits uh, at the moment. I think Nick's joining and can maybe shed some light on that. But um, let's do this. Let's go to item number two and then go back to item number one because uh, item number two is short and just an update. Uh, and then, yeah, then we'll go back to item number one uh, with some more detail from Christian's question. So, uh, yeah, Peter, if you could just uh, run through just a quick update of uh, Click and Rinkby. Uh, sure thing. So as uh, last time you kind of agreed that Click is uh, seems to be a good approach to make a simple enough proof of authority chain that uh, we can make this basically implement cross client. So uh, since then, um, uh, one of the things, one of the problems with uh, deploying Ringby or deploying it basically any testnet currently is that uh, it's a kind of a huge hassle. And um, one of the things that we, so it means a stats page, boot notes, whatever, those are kind of easy to do. One thing that uh, we kind of relied on the community until now is to provide, for example, a good faucet. And uh, of course, without that, a proof of authority test net is worth zero, unless somebody's, somebody's just staying at their computer and manually sending out ethers. So um, since then, uh, Basically, we've been working on a, on a small tool to actually help deploy these private networks, including Ringby. And I, actually, we also implanted a, a faucet based on a light client 
and GitHub authenticated faucet so that uh, anyone with a GitHub account can re request funds. And with that, I think uh, more or less the click and ring B work from the GoEtherium team's perspective is uh, kind of ready. I've uh, mostly writing up some tests. I found some corner cases. I added the documentation to the EIP. And, um, and just for the reference, uh, we are kind of planning to release the next version of GoEtherium next week. And we figured that uh, saying that, hey, this version uh, contains RingB and this is the new testnet and whatever, that might be a bit pushing it since uh, since the whole thing never went through a proper field test. So we're aiming to, to release kind of an Olympic version of RingB. So basically we provide all the, we provide the guide on how, you, how anyone could connect to it and they can play with the fossil, play with the sinus, play with whatever. And then if things go according to plan, then we can say that, okay, this remains RingB. Whereas if something blows up, then at least we'll have a more or less somewhat disclaimer that, yeah, we knew that since Geth is the only implantation, there might be some unforeseen issues. So it would be really nice if um, if sooner, sooner or later we could also add some other implantations there to validate that our code is actually correct. But that's kind of the status. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, is there any other implementations in the call that um, have an update on, or sorry, not tired this morning. Any other uh, Ethereum clients in the room who have an update on implementing a uh, click or plans to implement it? So CP Ethereum is currently focusing on, on Metropolis. Oh, yeah. I, I think, any, yeah, I think there's not like a, an expectation of CPP Ethereum to do it because, yeah, you're doing Metro and uh, uh, yeah, that's is, is also is... um. Uh, CPP Ethereum does it already work with other um, other non proof of work um, instances of Ethereum? So we have some kind of pluggable uh, consensus mechanism, but that's not. So I mean, it's in use for testing solidity, but not uh, in a, a networked way. Okay, sounds. So good. I guess it's not hard to implement. That's that's. Yeah, just priorities, no problem. Okay, awesome, Peter. And the next steps um, for the whole uh, Rink B and Click um, EIP is to move it from an issue to a PR. So now that the edge case has been identified, um, it's already pretty much written. It's just moving it literally from the issue section to the PR section and then uh, having some of the editors just check it over one more time before we... Uh, approve it since there hasn't really been anyone from the community who says it shouldn't go through and uh, any stakeholders have said that um, you know it's good to go okay great so uh, Nick's joined welcome Nick and uh, Christian if you don't mind repeating your question because I think Nick had mentioned it in the Skype chat so Gavin suggested to clear the return data buffer when memory is resized, what is the ex exact reason for that? And do we really need it? I think the idea is to um, minimize the maximum memory consumption. Um, otherwise, if you do a call which allocates a return data buffer and then um, do something that expands memory, the total memory consumption could be higher than it would have been under the current regime. Um, this would also allow you to implement uh, an implementation to have contiguous memory uh, for, for the entire call stack rather than having to allocate a separate chunk for each contract. Um, personally, I think it would be fine as long as it's defined to erase it after expansion so you can copy return data into newly expanded memory. Yeah, I mean, if it's possible, I would really like to avoid that because it, it kind of complicates quite some things. Which things does it complicate? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. In an optimizer, for example, you have to take care 
not to change the order of anything that enlarges memory and anything that reads from the return data. I mean, you okay. can, yeah, or it basically forces you to copy it out as the first thing you do after the call. I think that's, personally, I think it's okay to, to do that. Like, I think that's a good pattern. Because I mean, you, you already effectively have a, a barrier on where you can reorganize things because you can't reorganize it after another call. Uh, and it, it also complicates static analysis because I mean, determining whether memory actually increases is quite a complicated condition. Isn't it only ever expanded by um, in store and a couple of copy operations? Sure, anything that accesses memory might expand it, but you basically have to track, uh, have to keep track of the current size of memory. And you might not always know that. You're talking from the perspective of a compiler, right? No, a static analyzer. Okay. But... Oh, real quick, which EIP is this? Because Arkady just said he added comments to the PR. I can't recall the number off offhand to anyone else. Okay, looks like Martin posted it. Okay, it's in chat here. Okay, and I think Arkady's joining too, so he might be able to provide some idea from the like parody side of things what the idea was. Oh, okay, it looks like two eleven. Yeah, it looks like basically what Nick said. Okay, cool. I'm just reading through it right now. So it uh, increases the the uh, peak allocation more than what would be done today. So, I'm really tired. Is it actually 1400 UTC? Or like after that time? 1420, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Because, yeah, someone was asking, like, oh, is it already? And I think, yeah, Martin Beasy's uh, joining as well. Google. Google tells me it's uh, 1324 UTC time right now. Oh, it's 1324? Google says so. Yep, sorry, UTC at 1324. Uh, London time, it's 1424. Oh. Have I been putting the wrong time zone down? Let me look. Yeah, we are in GMT plus one at the moment. Okay. That could be causing confusion. I will have to change that. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, because I'm looking now at my notes, and it says 1400 UTC, and oh, that's 9 a.m. my time, not 8 a.m. Ah, okay, so I, this call started an hour early. That would explain why people weren't showing up. Well, anyways, everyone mostly is here now. So uh, back to, I guess, till Arkady um, 
gets in here. Let me go back to the agenda. Yeah. <sighs> Schedule calls by block number. Yeah, we could we could do that. Let's see. Oh, uh, item number three is EIP-186. I haven't really looked into this, but it seemed to be getting some community, uh, uh, I guess some community hype around it. Uh, reduce the issuance of uh, Ether before proof of stake. Does anyone have any comments on this? There's a carbon vote for it going on that... I, okay. I have. Uh, I... I don't really understand where this came from. I saw Vlad's Medium post about it, and I, I read it, and my, my opinion is that he he, he, man, he posted this as just uh, an idea out there, and then everyone started taking it really seriously. And my opinion is that unless we have a very serious reason that the system is broken and it should we should reduce the, the issuance, we should not be playing with it unless we also have like a very clear algorithm on, on when to reduce it or when to when to increase it. Otherwise, we risk making a very uncontroversial uh, update into a controversial hard fork just because we are playing what I think is it's economic policy. And I, I don't think we should be like tinkering economic policy just just because so that's my opinion. Anyone has so does anyone here has has any support for this or, or was was thinking about taking that seriously? Seriously, how how is the feeling of the room? I mean, I don't uh, particularly support this, but uh, I'm curious. As to how large the community support um, is about it. Yeah, I'm pulling up Carbon Vote to kind of see. Not that Carbon Vote in this case is really like a huge indicator. Yeah, Car Carbon Vote is 99% for it. It's, it has a million eater behind it. But honestly, I'm I'm not sure how many people how, how many people have taken that vote seriously. I know that I. I didn't vote. Um, I mean, I, I wasn't actually thinking that it was people were taking that seriously. So I'm not sure how. I think carbon vote measures what some people actually understand. And I know some. It was it first appeared during the DAO DAO vote. So that's that's sort of why people are taking that sort of seriously. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, I, I agree, Alex. The, I think the idea behind it was that um, as proof of stake uh, gets closer, there's going to be reduced incentives for miners. Um, so there's going to be a slower responsiveness in the system if there isn't uh, things done to change the issuance rate, I guess. And that's just purely for... Um, uh, I guess purely to help the miners, you know, have incentive to continue to mine, which I don't see as a problem the second, but I guess it'd be a good idea to at least have a plan if that becomes a problem. Wait, and reducing the minor reward would... would sorry, not reducing the minor reward, reducing incentives, sorry, reducing incentives for miners and so as to facilitate the adaption to the POS hard fork. Um, so it says, let's see. So yeah, basically, you actually know what, uh, to, uh, forget everything I just said. I don't understand what 186 is about. <laughs> okay, I, my so understanding was that the idea was to, uh, push off the, um, the ice age, but reduce issuance effectively proportional to if the Ice Age had was still happening, because that's all the miners have been promised, effectively. Hmm. And I guess, yeah. So, and promised by that, you mean, like, within roadmaps or whatever people have put out as roadmaps, or more just, like, codified? 
I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. You were saying, like, based on what, uh, compared to what the miners have been promised, do you mean, like, um, promised in a traditional sense, like, someone making them a promise, or, like, promise, like, that's how the system's set up, so that's how it's expected to run? Yeah, I, I mean, in code. So if the fork doesn't happen, then miners' income will reduce anyway because of the Ice Age. And the suggestion is that if we're going to fork to postpone the Ice Age, we should include some reduction in minor reward, which they would have had anyway. Oh, I see. Okay. Hmm. Uh, any other opinions in the room on that? But to be clear, that's not necessarily my opinion. I'm just, I think that's the idea behind it. Oh, yeah. No, I, Although, I, I get it. I, I generally think that it's not a bad idea as long as it's equal to or greater than the amount they would have got uh, with the Ice Age, because at that point there's no, they're not likely to oppose the fork because they'll be worse off if they do. Well, if 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 the switch for proof of work happens one year after after Metropolis, let's say it, let's say it happens in, in 2018, or one year and a half after that, does it make such a big difference on on on, on them? I, because I, I feel it wouldn't make such a big difference on the amount of whatever the miners would get. So that's why I'm, I'm saying that it, it's, it's making something that it, it might make this, this hard fork controversial one. Hmm. Yeah, I guess it's one of those like, and it might not even be a question of if it should I mean, go in, but maybe what should it even go in in Metropolis, or should it be thought about for a different hard fork? Yeah, I mean, am I wrong that it seems that no one in this room has any like strong opinions for or against it? It feels that it's something that came sort of from Vlad. Now the community is sort of asking around, and it's it's not something that anyone really wants, is it? Or so, or am I wrong? I would say that the people who are very interested in it are ones from a side of the Ethereum developer community that deals with a lot of the, I guess, economic policy and thought. So researchers, and a lot of the researchers are in Malta right now, so they're not on the call. Uh, Vitalik's chimed in a few times on this. Um, I think his opinion was kind of, this probably doesn't need to happen right now, but, and don't quote me on this, I need to look it up again, but last I read it was something like, if there's enough community support, it's worth considering, but otherwise, uh, he didn't really see the need for it this second, uh, was last I read. So, um, yeah, it sounds like, I mean, yeah, this isn't going to be decided in this call, but I think um, the things I wanted to get out was, if there was anybody who had initial thoughts, so thanks Alex and Nick and um, everyone, the other thing is, if something like this were to go in, like from a technical perspective, what change would, would this just be like a really simple change to, um, when I say simple, I don't mean um, simple to decide, but simple to change in code. I think... Yeah, I think that the change in code is 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 super simple, but I kind of agree with with Alex that even though like the 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 summary of all incomes will be greater, uh, it will be hard to defend that uh, in the social media and 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 places like that because uh, what will people will complain about is like. That's changing the the word from five to four and so on, and that that would that would be probably the the, the news titles. So it depends if we care about that. But I can like my perspective is it this is how it will go, and yeah, I agree. It will make the less controversial hard fork to very one very controversial one. I don't really so. Yeah, so I think the, the the other argument is that if you if you are going to postpone the ice age, basically that means that we are raising the, we are giving people more money by postponing the ice age. So we. Yeah, yeah, I understand that, but uh, we all know how it works. But that would be much harder to explain. Yeah, I, you're talking more from a, so. 
it's more in the grand scheme of things, is it better to implement this based on some possibilities that we're not sure yet, but then face the backlash of a more controversial hard fork and a lot of the, you know, complications that come from putting controversial things in a hard fork and maybe even setting a precedence of changing a lot of the core economic things just based off of, you know, on a, or people would look at it as us changing these core economic things on a whim. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, so, moving the Ice Age is already changing core economics on the whim, so... Yeah, that's a little bit more... So, but, but the balance there is that if it's not changed, then the block times would get would eventually get to the point where they would be um, interfering with normal you know, people's work with Ethereum. Something like this isn't going to change how transactions go through. The Ice Age was never meant to be taken into production in the sense that the Ice Age has always been a deterrent to force a fork. People never took it seriously that we wanted uh, to, to have the, like the system working during the Ice Age. The whole point of the Ice Age was always, at this point, we will need to do a fork, otherwise the system will stop. Otherwise, I mean, we we, we are not, no, no one is seriously thinking that Ethereum is supposed to have a 10 minute block time in the future. And that's, that's sort of ridiculous. So the Ice Age has always been, we need to do a fork by this time. Um, I mean, the idea was that proof of Proof of stake would be ready by then, but then then it's not. So I think con cons the the economic policy of the ICA should should not really count. And my really my, my real fear is that it seems that we are taking something that was isn't even like something that the community wants, and it's we are sort of creating a discussion and, and giving official status of it because simply people are asking. So. Oh, do, do you want that? I don't know. Do you want that? I don't know. And, and it sort of creates this 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 fake community support where I don't really see any. But maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good thing that we talk about this. It shows that we actually do listen to the community because this is obviously it doesn't come from us. It comes from the community. So it's worth talking about. Yeah, it's like super obvious that like the people in this call haven't even looked like looked or haven't been following it as closely as people in the community. So that's that. Yeah, that, I, I agree, Martin. That is good. And Alex, I would say that there are issues like that. This one in particular, the EIP has been there since like December or earlier. So well before the price increase and well before there, in my opinion, would have been incentive for something like this to come from like a miner or someone else. Um, and the Ice Age was um, the Ice Age was brought sooner because of, in part because of the price increase or as a side effect of the price increase. So uh, I, I think that the intentions behind it are good. So it's good to talk about. And if it comes down to you know the clients not wanting to implement it or uh, people you know broadly deciding not to, that's good. If there's a huge community push. Uh, we can come back and address this. Uh, we'll bring this up next meeting if anyone else has comments on it, uh, particularly people who've commented on it before, like potentially Yoichi or Vitalik. Are, <clears throat> Hudson, are we changing the block number for the Ice Age in Metropolis? Uh, does someone else know the answer to that? I forgot what we if we had talked about that. So the idea was that we kind of um, add a special rule to the difficulty calculation so that, for example, blocks 4 million to whatever million don't increase the difficulty. So it's kind of like a pause. So we already change it in Metropolis. Well, the alternative is to roll out a second hard fork immediately around Metropolis, and uh, I'm not sure that's a good idea to do two forks, one after the other. Yeah, so this, this, oh, just just about the ice age. Is that it? Well, there's really no point in. So if so, if the ice age hard fork is really just setting to an extra rule for the difficulty calculation, I don't really see why it would warrant uh, its own fork. Why can't we just add it to Metropolis? Yeah, I don't think, or at least from my notes from last meeting, I thought we, or two meetings ago, I thought we said that we were just having one hard fork for Metropolis, um, so this block number thing would be included in it. 
the kind of the uh, issuance uh, reducing the issuance is linked to the ice age and if you move if you reduce the difficulty of the ice age then kind of you give more money so it would it would be the same discussion as the uh, reducing the issuance oh yeah no i i agree with you on that i'm i'm talking about peter saying the two hard forks thing i think that the uh pausing of the ice age would be uh, a single hard fork i think it's been discussed before so there's there shouldn't be complications unless i'm wrong uh but yeah on your on your point um pavel i yeah that that would be something that would have to be in the metropolis fork um for it to take effect you know after the ice age is paused it, it's just a temporary pause right the, the ice age is set to restart after it, uh, after the four uh, at some point after four to reforce a four the future am i am i correct we are just sort of delaying the ice age then mm, yes yes the, the ice is supposed to be like just moved to the future but not removed entirely yeah and my understanding one was that as we got closer and we got updates from the research the ethereum research community about where they were on proof of stake which uh the last like a headline i saw was vitalik at some meeting saying they're like 75 percent done uh but i mean that was just a headline i saw so no idea by then we'll know kind of what it should be paused to to give us um, some breathing room. Uh, one last thing about this: the so the IEP, the the first paragraph ab about the IEP is is throwing terms like price supportive and increased investments. So I think it's very obvious from that IEP and from the fact that you're discussing it now after a price increase that this is this is more about price than, than technical reasons and therefore we should not be even like considering it so that's my opinion oh yeah are you reading the original eip or the modified eip the original one i'm not sure i'm i'm seeing the, the one you linked is oh one... so on the one i linked so basically light upon light uh they modified it with changes based on feedback but if you scroll down the original one from December, it says original EIP proposal below, and it might have the same stuff. I'm just uh, the, I'm okay, so I'm, I'm reading before the that's the modified still. So he, he, he says just abstract a reduction of the issuance is very likely to be price supported. And oh, the, yeah, yeah. So I, I see that as uh, as a so the well, let me try to put it this way the oh, 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 I see what you're reading. Okay, yeah, there definitely is a lot of um, non-technical words in there that try to bring up more of an economic argument rather than a technical thing. Yeah, so that's another reason not to support it. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I mean, to be fair, though, when you have an EIP and you um, enter it as an issue, it doesn't need to be technical. It can just be a spirit of... You know what change you want to happen uh but uh, it's definitely something where something that is more technically sound is going to be viewed or not technically sound i should say but more technically written rather than written on the terms of economics is going to be easier for us to read first um so yeah i think at this point it's pretty clear that there's not going to be any changes happening right this second and there's no decisions at this second but so what that means is nothing's going to happen unless there's a push from, um, you know, some client devs or core devs or uh, someone really wanting to make this change happen. Because I haven't heard anyone who's super in favor of this in this call. Great. So, um, Arkady, uh, Frankie, and Martin Beasy, welcome. Um, uh, so... Christian had a question on EIP 211 uh, about extending memory, and Arkady, I saw you posted a comment in there. Sorry for putting the wrong time. Uh, I got my time zones mixed up, so thanks everyone for being uh, flexible with that. Um, 
So, Arkady, if you could expand on what you commented at the end of 2.11, just to kind of give your perspective on why um, this is uh, this should be done. Well, so the concern is that the EIP increases maximum memory consumption. And it's basically explained in the comment if you... So you have to keep return data around from the call that you've made. But if you allocate memory, if you expand memory before reading return data, you would get higher peak memory usage. That's basically it. Arkady, can we uh, perhaps have a call after this call to see whether there are any workarounds, any other workarounds? Yeah, sure. It's it's still not that. that much of a showstopper or deal breaker, but just something to be concerned about. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so having a separate call would be good and also just talking about it at the EIP. So it sounds like uh, yeah, if anyone is interested in doing that, just ping uh, Christian and have him loop you in on whatever conversation happens. So, cool. Please, please do include me. Um, for what it's worth, I don't think this allows an attacker to allocate more memory for the same guess uh, as previously, but it does mean that some ordinary cases will allocate more memory than they did previously. Okay, interesting. Cool. Any other comments on that? All right. Great. So we've gone through, yep, we've gone through that. We've gone through 186. Uh, so the last item is, uh, and then any other items people want to add after that, but the last item on the agenda is uh, Metropolis updates. So um, let's just start with... Um, Parity, uh, Arkady, if you could give us uh, an update on where Parity's at uh, implementing those. And then also, you know, actually, let's not do that. Let's start with Dimitri. Uh, Dimitri, if you could give us an overview of how the tests are going and also um, give us a little bit of insight about how we can help um, as far as either sending you, you know, whatever data or information you need to help make these tests better. Uh, so to make the test better, it would be really helpful if all of the EIPs that we are um, already considered to be um, implemented for sure. So this EIP should be um, marked or flagged with some label on the GitHub. So I could uh, add it to this filter and see um, uh, which EIPs are already um, considered valid. Because right now I see lots of AIPs and uh, many different versions of the same AIP. And yeah, that's kind of... Um, yeah, I, I hear you on that. So if you go to the README page, we have something called Accepted EIPs uh, Chart and EIPs Under Consideration. And that's going to be cleaned up after this call because uh, okay. the EIPs Under Consideration are going to be uh, consolidated or the status has changed to um, show the latest data. Uh, but Casey and I also talked about last time having a column for uh, which, I guess, if it's going to go into Metropolis or if it's just accepted EIP, just but non-hard fork change EIP. Uh, so would that be sufficient, or is there something more fine-grained you would need from that on the EIP's mm. repo? I think we should um, use a label to um, distinguish the IPs uh, that should be implemented for Metropolis changes. Okay, great. Yeah, we can also add a label. That That's really easy to do. You yeah, mean like a GitHub label, right? Yeah, to the issues of the CIPs. Like I, I saw there is a Metropolis label and uh, one closed issue on that. But I don't know whether it was canceled or implemented. I don't know. Yeah, it's I, like no problem. Or we could have the meta eep listing all the issues for the hard fork. Yeah, you, uh, Alex, you actually you have an EIP about that, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a really good idea. I think we should do that. Um, I'm gonna put that in my notes uh, to 
do that. Like, uh, so Alex's idea, and l let me know if I'm saying this wrong, Alex, is, uh, yeah, just having an EIP that lists all of the uh, yeah. stuff that's going into Metro and then changing it as, as it goes. Uh, yeah, might work as well. And um, as for the implementation, um, we already did uh, revert code and the uh, test for that are already ready. And um, I saw that some clients started to implement uh, general state tests. Um, it's now optional. And uh, if you want to be updated uh, with the uh, recent tests, then you probably want to implement uh, general state tests. And uh, as the uh, test uh, will be completed, I will convert all of the general status into um, ordinary blockchain tests, like I already did for the revert of code tests. And uh, then I guess Martin Svender, he will be running those um, blockchain tests on uh, Hive. And um, every client that implemented this RPC protocol of importing blocks will be tested through Hive. Yeah, but not every test is uh, converted to that yet. And um, general state tests are um, most updated ones. Okay, great. That, that sounds awesome. And uh, what is the best way to communicate with you in order to um, ask you questions or send you test or data? Uh, it's Gita and Skype. Okay, great. So um, if you could, yeah, actually, I'll just like send this on the All Core Devs channel, your your info after. You can paste it in there yourself, whichever one. Um, yeah, so that sounds good. Great. Uh, any other updates, Dimitri, on that end? Okay, then transaction tests, um, they're done halfway. And uh, we have two different transaction tests. Uh, one of them will be implemented in state tests. Uh, for state transition on the, this zero signature transaction. And uh, other tests are just checking transaction uh, fields. And that one already been uh, updated to the, ah, yeah, and one, one more update. And now we using this branch on the test repository. And uh, every particular change uh, will be implemented in a separate branch. And uh, I'll, I'll try to post a link to the to this. And uh, for the Metropolis test, I posted the Google document um, on the Skype test channel. And uh, I guess, yeah, I'll try to find it right now and post it on our chat as well. There, I described the test cases that I already implemented. And I want so other people to review the document and perhaps um, printed uh, some ideas, posted comments, um, maybe some new cases that they take in mind, that they have in mind. And um, this would um, help us to create better test coverage. Also in the document, I put a link to the uh, test repository branch and uh, the test sources and the compiled test as well. All right, awesome. Yeah, that sounds really well organized and uh, it's going to be really helpful for, for doing all this stuff. Okay, great. Yeah, and I see you posted the link. So we'll get that distributed yeah. to the different clients. Um, I'll, I'll try to make sure everyone gets that. And I mean, everyone in the all core devs channel should get it anyway. Um, anyone have questions for Dimitri? Uh, any of the client devs? All right, cool. So let's just run through some of the clients real quick, get an update on uh, where they're at. Uh, so Arcady, uh, Parity, any uh, updates, issues, comments? So we have most of the EAPs that we consider ready. So seven out of 10. Uh, yeah, just waiting on finalization for return data size EIP. And there is a couple of minor ones left. But otherwise, we are good, I think. All right, 
great. And we're getting that cleared up um, real soon. We, we made a lot of that um, those decisions earlier today for mm -hmm. the return data size and that kind of stuff, except for some of the nuance or the minor things within them, but we at least know which EIPs are going in and which ones aren't. Um, and then, let's see, uh, C++. So I think, I guess, uh, oh, Christian, yeah. Uh, I don't know, Pavel, Andre, can you report there, please? Oh, he might have walked away. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I think we are somewhere in the middle, I would say. So I have not prepared exact data, but uh, some of APs are pretty much finished. Some of them are merged already. And uh, I think two or three are, uh, it's around at the beginning. Okay, sounds great. Um, and then uh, go, I guess that'd be Peter. Yep, so uh, basically uh, Jeff started working on the Metropolis, um, Metropolis EIPs. He kind of uh, he wasn't feeling too good in the last few weeks. So uh, as far as I know, he did some work. He pushed some PRs, but I cannot, uh, basically I don't know uh, exactly where he's at. The rest of the team was mostly busy preparing the next release, so we didn't uh, work on the PRs ourselves. I mean, the EIPs ourselves. Okay, actually, I, I just saw a Skype message from him earlier, I just remembered, uh, that said they're pretty much all done uh, on the geth end, except for, like, like um, Arkady mentioned, the ones that aren't necessarily finalized or, like, officially, like, we know they're officially going in or not. Um, so, okay, cool. And then, uh, finally, is there any other clients in here? Uh, Conrad, are you still working on Pi Ethereum, or are you primarily with a different group? Oh, Conrad, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. It sounds like you're really far away. He might be having microphone problems. Does anyone know? So, um, which client does Conrad work on, generally? I'm just blanking right now. Okay, I'm or looking at Python. Python. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Uh, currently, mostly concerned with getting back to main chain. Okay, sounds great. Cool. I think that covers all the clients. Um, so yeah, uh, as far as overall Metropolis goes, I think, and I just want to hear some opinions on this, I think by next all-core dev meeting, we should be pretty much giving like the final final on what EIPs are going in or not, just so that we can start hammering down on test. Or maybe it's um, still too early to do that. Uh, what, what's everyone's opinion on that? Are we kind of wrapping up with what's going to go in or not? On the next one, you mean? Yeah, because if we were shooting for something like end of June, um, which has been talked about before, that's going to be how many months away? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's like basically three months away, a little less than that. So, yeah, and if we're going to do a test net and stuff, we should probably have things kind of finalized by next all core dev meeting, I'd say. So yeah, I can't really enforce that, but uh, that's my opinion. And next all core dev meeting, I'll try to make sure we can get that done. Um, let's see. Any other comments on Metropolis stuff?
cool. Oh, Christian, I think I just saw you rejoin. I was asking any more comments on uh, Metropolis stuff. If otherwise, that item's done. Yeah, sorry, I had some connectivity issues. Uh, no, no comments from me. Oh, and uh, Christian, just because um, I know uh, you've worked on or like mentioned talked on many of the EIPs. Do you think that uh, we're pretty much at a point where by next all core dev meeting we can say no more EIPs are going in uh, for Metro, so we can kind of put like a hard stop, kind of finalize the specs behind them and get tests done. I mean, the proposed EIPs for Metropolis kind of settled some weeks ago already, right? So. Pretty much, yeah. The the, the mm. last things were the static and and the or whatever the return data size and all that stuff. I was just um, I'm more double checking. Yeah, but I guess so. Yes, no, I mean, yeah. Not sure if we can. So I mean, finalizing the specs. That is something that will. Oh happen no 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 yeah that won't be done yeah. next week or not yeah. that won't be done next all core dev meeting. I'm more finalizing like no other EIPs getting in there, which I, I yeah I didn't think there were any others. I was just gonna make sure I, I didn't miss anything. Yep. Cool. All right. Um, that's the last official agenda item. Um, I see Martin Beasy's in here. Uh, did you have any like cool updates on Ewasm or anything you wanted to talk about, or are you just kind of lurking? Uh, yeah, I'm just kind of lurking right now. Um, right now I'm just working on updating, um, uh, Ethereum GSTX and Ethereum GS block. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, let's see. Any, any other comments? That's the last agenda item, so we can, we can pretty much wrap it up. Just one Good mm -hmm. comment. Um, I think we've discussed. Uh, so, since the last court that meeting, we are um, trying to figure out. Well, on or off, just played around with the thought of how we could uh, sort out the transaction propagation stuff to basically allow propagating tran cheap transactions that may or may not be ever mined. And uh, a proposal that we had quite a long time ago came up again. That uh, one of the issues currently with uh, with transactions is that basically they uh, their lifetime is infinite. So if I create a transaction, it may be included now or it may be included in 10 years. And this one kind of makes it um, a bit harder to reason about. And this kind of, uh, so one of the issues, I'm not sure if you remember it, uh, maybe it was last year, there was uh, the Bitcoin network was spammed. And I think there were transactions which lingered in the network for more than eight months. And uh, it would be nice if uh, we could, so, so Propagating cheap transactions would probably be much uh, much saner if we could say that a transaction has a limited lifetime. So I'm not sure whether anyone is wants to do such an EIP. If uh, but if there's at least some opening from the client developers' perspective, we could put together an EIP that would kind of state that uh, a transaction could specify that. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe it could specify. We could hard limit that a transaction. If, you, if I create a transaction in block, I don't know, one million, it can only live for about I, maybe a thousand blocks or a random number. Sorry? Oh, Pavel, I think you're unmuted unless you had a comment. I'm sorry. No I, I, I think it's an excellent idea. And I think uh, I think we could probably make the hard limit a lot higher than a thousand, but I think the idea was is good that uh, transactions should have a either a timestamp field or a block number field um, and at which they should expire and we limit how far in the future that can be. Uh, and the, uh, the other added benefit is for uh, for users. For example, if uh, if I want to create a transaction that, that I want to pro be processed right now, because for me it's important that it's either processed right now or it's not processed at all, then I could say that, okay, the lifetime is maybe five blocks. And if it's not included in five blocks, then, okay, I don't care. Don't get it included. This kind of uh, many times. So otherwise we had in the past, we had this issue that uh, somebody wrote a script, which uh, they screwed up the script and they sent hundreds of transactions, basically with uh, incrementing nonsense to send their funds to wherever. And then every time their account got a, 
uh, got funds, it was sent out wherever because in the network, the transaction did linger in some queue and they got, did get executed. So it would also help solve these kind of issues where, where if you create a transaction, it's not included in a limited amount of time, then you don't get surprises down the line. Yeah, uh, one potential problem with this is that it would break offline signs. But you need the nonce anyway, and which is a similar thing. You do, but um, with a nonce, you can, good. in principle, sign something on the Agapt machine and then transport it to uh, a node and transmit it from there. Whereas if you have a hard limit, then you've got uh, strict time constraints on doing that. So there is an EIP by Conrad, which is, I think, related here. And it's primary yeah, he target talked, is... he talked about it in chat, actually. It's the ab abstraction EIP, which I guess would be, is that referring to Serenity's abstraction EIP thing for the future? Oh, he gave up on it. Uh, do you have a link to it, Conrad? I think we're talking about different things. So Conrad, I think it was Conrad, made an EIP, which was mainly targeted at replay protection. And if I remember correctly, the idea there was uh, that uh, you specify a, a block hash and the transaction can only be included if the, the block hash is a parent of the, of the block or if, if, if the block with that hash is a parent of the block and it's not too old kind of. I thought the idea was to put the actual transaction into data field and then um, analyze it with some smart contract. Yes, but if we want it to be useful for DOS protection, um, then it needs to be a part of consensus. Well, actually, that's not quite true. The other way we could handle this is to change the wire protocol so that clients tell each other when they first saw a transaction. Well, yeah, but that's that gets messy really fast if you if somebody spams transactions, really lots of transactions in the network. Yes, and that client can effectively lie about when they saw it. So anyway, the the question here is rather, would this something be of interest? We obviously don't have the details yet, so this is something just to ponder about. I I'm happy to write an eight for it. Yeah, in fact, Nick, could you work with Conrad on that? Because it sounds like Conrad had some good initial thoughts on that, and then he's super um, uh, angst, or he really wants to talk, but his microphone doesn't work. So if we have an EIP on that, um, either before next all core dev meeting or the one after that, and we could talk about it, that that would be really cool. Sounds good. Great. But yeah, sounds like there is interest in this. Awesome. Uh, is there any other... Um, comments of any kind before uh, we end the call? Uh, yes, there was one thing that I've been discussing on Skype that I wanted to bring up, which is the possibility of, uh, first of all, hopefully is contentious, making a return data copy uh, throw if you attempt to um, uh, copy beyond the end of the return data. And second, more contentiously changing call data copies do the same. And the motivation behind this is that currently we pad them with zeros, but this is more or less a uh, assuming what they probably want thing. And my own view is that the EVM should hard error when it's not sure what should be happening rather than give a default result, um, because that would, for example, combat errors like the recent um, exchange era where they were sending short transaction data that was resulting in unexpected consequences. One question here though, that uh, this does solve part of the problem. I'm, I'm not sure whether you are referring to the attack that... Uh, um, was, was it Gollum or...? Yeah, yeah, Gollum, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so uh, the only issue is that, so um, so there the issue was that uh, you read after, basically the user provided some input and you read past that input. However, for example, if a contract, if I write a contract that requires, that has five input variables, 
and certain code paths only use the first four, then I might get still the same effect of uh, shifted interpretation. Yes, it, it doesn't solve all cases, but it's a, it seems to me that it, um, I, this way I can't think of a legitimate reason for a contract to want to read past the end of the data. And therefore it seems to me that precautionary principle, we ought to throw an error if it does. So you, I think I saw in, the, in a Skype chat that you did a cursory search, and the only place you found where it does that is in uh, some serpent code from Augur. Is that right? That's right. Uh, I'm running. I'm actually running it over every single transaction ever, but that's going to take a very long time because it only does a couple of blocks a second. Um, but so far, I, every transaction I've identified has been calling that one Augur contract. And I, I didn't read Vitalik's explanation, but what, what did he kind of say on that? Um, the reason it does it is it's a serpent compiler optimization. Um, it attempts to, the, the goal is read out all of the call data except for the signature, function signature at the beginning. And it lazily does this by uh, reading from four to call data length. Um, whereas it should read from four to call data length minus four. It's doing this to, to skip, the minor, uh, skip the subtraction, which it sees isn't necessary. So as far as I know, though, that's the only thing currently that's relying on the ability to read zeros. Oh, okay, so it's an idiosyncrasy. It's not a. It's not like actually on purpose. For the yeah, it's a well, it's an optimization that optimization, takes advantage yeah. of this. Um, and yeah, I mean, if if Augur is the only contract, then perhaps we can find some workaround for them. Or um, you know, it, it remains to be seen whether this happens much on the chain. Um, and I'll get back to people. So when I the know. fact that that this never, I'm sorry. Okay. So the fact that this never happened doesn't mean that there is no contract that relies upon this behavior, right? That's true. Um, but I believe uh, we can say with a fair degree of certainty that outside serpent, uh, like that, that no solidity contract relies on this behavior unless it has in line assembly. Um, and I do find it difficult to believe that anyone is relying on this behavior except as an optimization for, for call data length. I mean, it, it does complicate it. Uh, it does complicate the Ethereum virtual machine and it also makes it less consistent. So I'm really Sorry, not sure whether we should go down. Less consistent with what? Uh, any single uh, thing inside the Ethereum virtual machine, any anything, any single data area extends to infinity with zeros. So, so yeah, yeah, this is our concern as well. It kind of breaks a well-defined source data definition for, for us. So the, I mean, what, what data sources do we have? We have memory, which, even, which extends infinitely because it, it, it expands as requested. Um, and then we have call data and soon return data. Are there any others? We also have code. Yes. Uh, does I mean I would argue that code copy should also um, should also throw this error. Like I, I guess the the thing is uh, memory. I think I would argue is a different beast because it's writable. Um, but in the case of input sort of byte array input parameters, I don't think we should uh, assume the best and return zeros because I don't think, aside from like a trivial compiler optimization, there is any legitimate reason to try and read past the end of the array. I think it almost always indicates an error. I would suggest this to go into a separate EAP and not the return. Yeah. That well, I, I think I think the idea of changing existing stuff needs to go in a separate EIP. But I think that the proposal to make return data copy error can be an amendment to the current one. Like I, I would argue that uh, even despite the inconsistency, this is a rule that's worth enforcing in future, even if we're unable to grandfather it for existing opcodes. What about putting? A recommendation into the return data uh, copy EIP that uh, you should not access it beyond its its end. 
So basically, it's und it's, it's yeah more or less undefined behavior or not well, recommended to do that. And in the future, it might change. I I think if we're going to change it, then now would be the time. I mean, yes, that would at least ensure that anyone who breaks it breaks themselves by relying on it later is you know has on themselves to blame. But I think it would be better to actually just fix it straight away. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I think that it does sound like it could be an amendment to the EIP. Um, so, yeah, so if it, I guess the, the question that comes to my mind is just how much it complicates it. Like, I've kind of heard that it, you know, it kind of breaks away from the standards. Um, is there some kind of domino effect in the future from doing that? Or that will, by doing that, will make it even more complicated for other things, or is it just simply this one, this one thing that would complicate it in the in the EVM? Mm, can I add one one comment for that? Sure. Because I think, um, like, uh, contract ABI for for uh, methods without arguments, uh, you have like four bytes for. For the method ID, and I think here we rely on that that we can load actually uh, 32 bytes on the stack, relying on that the rest will be filled with zeros. Yes, uh, I agree, and I think that any change would have to state that uh, call data. Uh, what is it? The, the one to fetch a single word. Uh, only errors if you attempt to if the entire extent of it is past the end of the array, because yes, otherwise it would make fetching the function call ID into onto the stack impossible except via memory. Uh, in any case, I will write up an e and write up a, a comment on the existing return data one, and we can argue when we've got something concrete to argue about. <laughs> Is anyone still there? Yes. I am. Uh, yeah. I guess we've come to an end, for, a natural end for this particular discussion. Because one, one thing was raised on the Skype chat as well, that this might, um, this might be useful to be considered on the higher level languages and enforce that on the higher level languages by uh, issuing call data size uh, before particle load or copy. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't disagree with doing it in higher level languages, but I think that the general principle in the EVM should be that um, when somebody is doing something that is almost certainly wrong, we should fail hard rather than uh, fail soft, which I, which is you know returning zeros, for instance. Well, I personally, I would fail in all of the cases if it tries to overread, but that might be too harsh of a change. Yeah, I, I think at this point it's impractical to fail when somebody does call data load um, on zero because that's done all the time with functions that have no arguments. Um, if it was from day one, then I might, you know, agree with you. Yeah, it, it actually this this is good to have historical context on this. What what's the general approach when we come up? Um in the system with something like this? Do we fail hard generally, or was that something that was a design decision early on um, for these type of things, uh, or these type of error, uh, not errors? I can't think of the words. <laughs> Edge cases. Perhaps. Edge cases, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I wasn't there, but when looking at the EVM, it feels like um, 
to some degree this wasn't considered as a, an explicit design principle so in some places it fails hard um, but in most places it fails soft another example being as Vitalik pointed out one divided by zero yeah. uh, which for reference it returns zero four rather than throwing an exception <laughs> I think the idea was to, to only fail hard if there's no sensible way to continue and I think that's like entirely the wrong. Long jump test. Yeah, I think that's entirely the wrong approach. Personally, I think that's the approach MySQL took, uh, and that led to numerous bugs where it assumes things about your data type and so on. I think that anything as critical as as EVM code uh, should always assume the worst. Sure, but I mean, I think the main question here is: uh, should we fix it now? And is it is it worth the risk of breaking contracts? I, I think that uh, if we can demonstrate that uh, of all the historical transactions, you know, that it, that it has limited effect, then I think it's worth the risk of breaking things. I think if we find that there's a, you know, it would break a whole lot of historical transactions, then that's a different matter. And I think that for um, return data copy, it's worth being inconsistent with prior stuff in favour of doing the right thing. Wouldn't uh, the broken contracts your scan failed to find because no transaction trickled the bug then be uh, resources for some hacker to use to cause damage later by causing these contracts to fail? What sort of damage would they cause by causing I, I, I don't know enough to know. It just makes me nervous that we make a change because there's contracts that would work before to not work. And so, I mean, yeah, no, I, I understand the concern. Um, we have done this in the past, like when we rejigged gas costs, um, that can cause things to fail that didn't in the past. So are you concerned or not? I personally am not overly concerned because I think that uh, breaking contracts that, or potentially breaking contracts that used to work is an inevitable consequence of, of a lot of hard forks, like the gas repricing, for instance. So um, I think we need to be cautious, but I, I see limited potential for breaking things uh, or, you know, for an attacker being able to cause havoc because a contract now fails that didn't used to. Okay. I, I could be convinced otherwise by a, a concrete example, of course. Hmm. Okay, so it sounds like more research is to be done. And so Nick's doing that generation. He's going to write up some of the more formal stuff, and then uh, we can duke it out next all core dev meeting. Cool. So, uh, yeah, any other comments, uh, other stuff in general? All right, great. Uh, sorry again for having this at the wrong time. Jan, I think you just got here, and I totally uh, started this an hour early. Like, I started this at 1300 instead of 1400, so apologies. Um, I'll be releasing notes. Uh, Jan left. Oh, well. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, coming. I'll be releasing notes and video later. Bye. All right. Bye, everybody. Right.